Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. Isn't it wonderful that we continue to live into the Easter story, right? It is a beautiful thing. Um, so, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to you who are here in the pews. Ah, good to see Gary with his new What's going on inside is working well. Yay, and Sherry, good to see you. Good to see all of you, that's great news. Um, welcome to you who are here in the pews. Welcome to you who may be joining us online. Do we have the, oh, we got it going. Thanks to Cindy who rebooted uh, our Wi-Fi so we can be present online. We are grateful for that. Um, I'm going to begin with your announcement, Sandra. I just wanted to thank the deacons for the wonderful breakfast that they provided for us last Sunday after Easter sunrise service, and for all Yay, the work that they did to help us out. So that was a big thank you for the sunrise after sunrise service breakfast that the deacons did. That is so gracious and wonderful. I'm sorry we missed it. Um, and Julie. Phil has asked me to make an announcement. The Supper Club is going back, is coming back. Woo! Yay, April the 16th at Valerio's, 5.30, it's a Tuesday. And there's a sign-up sheet over here where the Christmas tree usually is. Put, um, the name and the number in your party because we need to make reservations. And next week he said he would have a menu for us. But please let's everybody make an attempt to join together for fellowship and good eating. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Matt is off chasing the eclipse today and big thanks to Beth who is our company miss today. And, um, you will note that uh, for the middle hymn, I um, put in something, a hymn that's been entitled, Why Must Doubt Be Such a Bad Thing? And it's to the tune of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And as Beth and I were talking, it's a lot of words to fit in, but let's give it a try just because it's a really lovely, lovely hymn. Um, let's see, are there any specific Prayer concern. Yes, Dottie. Thank you. Good. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yay, Mike Smith. Yay, Mike Smith is doing better, almost back to normal. I, and I was thinking how lovely it is. We miss you, Matt, if you're watching. Yes, Julie. Okay, the 10th. That's soon, right? Yes, Wednesday. Okay. Okay, Mary, we are praying for you, holding you in God's love and light, and trust all will be well. Um, thank you for that reminder. So let's remember Mary... Uh, through the week, but particularly on Wednesday and then afterwards for quick recovery. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Those of us who know that, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, funeral. Yeah, let's remember um, the family of uh, the Fowler family. Um, I am so grateful for Pastor Jamie, who officiated at that service and continues to offer wonderful pastoral care. Um, I'm also thankful to see members, some members of the choir out here. It's lovely to see you um, adding to our voices here. So, good. All right. Let's worship God together on this beautiful second Sunday of Easter.
stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. The stone is rolled away and we are perplexed. The grave cloths are lying in the tomb and, and we, we cannot, cannot fathom what, what has happened. Can the words of the angels be true? Dare we believe the good news of resurrection? Yes, yes. Morning, morning has broken. A new day is here, for Christ our Lord is risen indeed. First scripture reading is from Psalms 46, verses 1 through 5, and verse 10. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Be still and know that I am God. The word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. The name of this is Slow Down, so if we need to take a moment while the technology is happening, it is well for us to slow down.
Record soloists are Amanda Woodbury, soprano. In the midst of my confusion In the time of desperate need When I'm thinking not too clearly A gentle voice does intercede
Please join me in the corporate prayer of confession. Even as we rejoice in the good news of resurrection, we confess that we so easily can get distracted. Distracted by the many things which claims our attention, today help us to be still and know that you are God. And now let's take a few moments for our silent prayer of confession. And now the assurance of pardon. Know that our God of love knows your heart, hears your prayers, and offers you grace and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Scripture reading from John 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the sides of the marks of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, once again, peace be with you. Then Thomas, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, because these are written, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. And let's give this song a try, and Sandra's going to help us with this. Thank you.
have a seat. <laughs> Love that. Christ will find us all regardless, more than we could e'er conceived. Those are words of grace. So I love the ancient stories of the saints. And in particular, the story of Christopher, who I thought of last week when we traveled. Tim and I went to Iowa and back, and on the way back, we were in Ohio and Indiana and Kentucky, somewhere in there, when the tornado <laughs> sirens started going off. And um, it was like, oh, thankfully we were able to find a hotel and did fine. But St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. So, Yay, St. Christopher. But I particularly like his story because it speaks to those of us who experience both doubt and faith. Doubt and faith. Anyone else here have moments of both doubt and faith? <laughs> I'm probably not alone, yeah. As a young man, the story is told that Christopher happened to be gifted in every way. He was gifted in every way except in faith. Now, he was this big man physically. He was powerful and strong, and he would often use his physical strength to help others. He was also really good-hearted and easygoing. Christopher was one of those people that was just liked by everyone. His one struggle was that he found it hard to believe in God. For him, it was the material realm, the physical, that which was real meant something to him, and everything else seemed unreal. However, Christopher yearned to believe in God, and he deeply respected those around him who did have a deep faith. And so Christopher lived his life in what we could say was a kind of honest agnosticism. He was unable to really believe in anything beyond what he could physically see or touch or feel or smell. However, this did not prevent Christopher from using his gifts to lovingly serve others. And so he became this ferry boat operator and he spent his life helping carry people with his ferry across a very dangerous river. Well, one night during a storm, the ferry boat collapsed, capsized, and Christopher dove into those dangerous dark waters to rescue a young child. Carrying that child to shore, he looked into this child's face, and there he saw the face of Christ. And after that, he believed. For he had seen the face of Christ, and the name Christopher, we are told, actually means Christ bearer. Now, as I read, church historians have argued whether this particular story is mostly fact or mostly fiction, or a combination thereof. But I don't really think it matters how much of it was fact or fiction or stretched or whatever, because it's a story that addresses one of the most difficult questions of all. What do I do and what do you do when our faith feels at best kind of weak? And what should be our reaction when God seems silent, when God seems distant or even non-existent, 
How might we move from believing in only what we can see and feel and touch and smell to also believing in this existence of a spiritual reality? St. Christopher's answer, live as honestly and respectfully as you can in this moment. Use your gifts to help others. And in the midst of all that, you just may see the face of Christ. I know that's been my experience, how the face of Christ has shown up in unusual places and unusual times even in the midst of my own uh, doubts or wonderings. Excuse me. Now you might also notice that there's a lot of pollen around. <laughs> this brings us to John chapter 20 and to our companion in both doubt and faith. This apostle is often called Doubting Thomas, I like to call him Honest Thomas. Honest Thomas because throughout the Gospels, if you read through the Gospels, you'll notice that he is the one that will often have the courage and authenticity to actually ask the question or say the very thing that most everyone else in the room is also wondering and thinking, right? Haven't we all been there? Someone says something we're all thinking, and we hope someone's going to ask the question. Really? <laughs> right? Well, that was often Thomas. He spoke plainly. He spoke honestly. For instance, the week before the crucifixion, you might remember that Jesus was determined to go to Bethany to see his good friends, uh, Mary and Martha and, Eliz and Lazarus. And you may remember that Bethany was located deep in enemy territory. And so all his friends, his disciples, were saying, don't go there, Jesus, it's too dangerous. <laughs> Not Thomas. Honest Thomas simply said this. Let us also go that we may die with him. No sugarcoating for Thomas. Then there was the last time that Thomas and others had supper with Jesus, right? And Jesus, you may remember during the long talk after supper, that Jesus was talking about his death, about dying. And Jesus said that he'd get things ready for them when the time was right. And as soon as he was going, he'd prepare a place for them. And Jesus assured them, John 14, 5, you know the way to the place I am going. Okay. Dead silence in the room, right? Crickets, you know the way to the place I am going. No one breathed a word except good old honest Thomas he couldn't hold back. He said to Jesus, I have no idea where you are going. <laughs> so how can I know the way to get there? Honest Thomas. Jesus then answers Thomas by saying, I am the way. <laughs> now, Thomas didn't do a follow-up question, but I imagine Thomas muttering under his breath, yeah, Jesus, right. You're a man, you're not a way. I wish you'd stop talking in riddles. Honest Thomas. Well, shortly after that last supper with Jesus, we know that all the things that everybody was afraid would happen, well, it actually happened. And Jesus was dead, just as he said he would be. But then, but then, that beautiful thing that nobody quite believed what actually happened, hallelujah, that happened too, and Christ arose. Now, Honest Thomas wasn't around at the time, but all the rest of the disciples were there. As we read, there they were crowded in this room with the door locked because they were afraid, 
and then Jesus suddenly appears. Jesus offers them the greeting of shalom. Notice he keeps saying, may the peace of God be with you. <laughs> shalom, shalom, shalom. And there they were with Jesus, who shows them enough of where the Romans had let Jesus have it to convince them that he was as real as they were, if not more. And then Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit, gives them a few instructions, and in one of the other Gospels that I didn't read today, this was my favorite, one of my favorite questions Jesus asks. He says, do you have anything to eat? But anyway, that's in a different Gospel, and I love. So Jesus breathes on them the Holy <laughs> Spirit, and then he leaves. So Thomas wasn't there, right? It doesn't tell us what Thomas was up to. Maybe he went out for a cup of coffee. Maybe he just needed some alone time. We don't know. But he wasn't there. But when Thomas does finally return and he hears what happens, he basically says, unless Jesus comes back and I can actually see him for myself, y'all, I'm just thinking this must have been a figment of your imagination. I understand what you wish for, but wishful thinking isn't going to do it for me, right? Well, eight days later, Jesus did come back, and this time, thankfully, Thomas was in the locked room with them. And Jesus says directly to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand in my side. Believe. Yes, Jesus spoke directly to Thomas. But did you notice what Jesus did not say? There isn't a rebuke in his words. There is no laying on of guilt like, how dare you not believe initially. There is no lecture about doubting. Jesus doesn't chew Thomas out for his unbelief. And while he does say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, he also gently and I think mercifully simply offers to Thomas what it is that Thomas wanted and what Thomas needed. One could say that Jesus met Thomas right where he was, just as Jesus will meet you and I just where we are, just as we are, right? In the words of Ronald Rollheiser, he writes this, skepticism is not a problem as long as one is honest, not rationalizing, not lie lying, and generous in service to others. The stories of St. Christopher and Thomas assure us that God is neither angered nor threatened by an honest agnosticism. In other words, doubt is not a deal breaker for Jesus. I love that. I close with um, a portion from, um, it's called the Children's Story Bible. So it's kind of a Bible paraphrased um, for children. It's written by Ralph Milton. And the, this chapter is entitled, Thomas Asks Questions. A few days later, Thomas and his friends were together, and all the doors were closed, but suddenly there was Jesus in the room with them. Thomas began to cry. He was so happy to see Jesus, saying, Oh, yes, it is you, Jesus. I am so glad. Now that I know you are alive, I won't ask any more questions. And in the paraphrase, Milton has Jesus responding with these words. Oh, Thomas, don't stop asking questions. I am glad you were able to see me so you can be sure. Then you can believe. But there's going to be lots of people who won't be able to see me. They will ask questions too. 
It's going to be hard for them to believe, just as it was hard for you to believe. I will need you, Thomas, to tell them the story. You mean, said Thomas, you're not angry because I didn't believe right away? <laughs> not angry at all, said Jesus. I like it when people ask hard questions. But Thomas, you're just not going to understand everything. You will never find answers to all your questions. But just remember that I love you and that God loves you. Nobody can prove that part, but it's the part that is most true of all. Indeed, friends, can you hear Jesus say that to you? Remember that I love you and that God loves you. Nobody can prove that part, but it's the part that is most true of all. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God of the resurrection, you come to us and you invite us into new life. And we are grateful. We are grateful that you receive all of us just as we are. <laughs> our beliefs and our questions. You do not turn away from us when we have doubts, but you walk with us and you show us yourself. We thank you today for all the good gifts you have given us along the way. Thank you for your healing touch with Gary and with Mike. We thank you ahead of time for your healing presence with Mary this week and her surgery. We pray for the Fowler family that they may know your grace and your comfort. We thank you, God, for that phone call or the text that comes just when we need it, for friends who help us laugh, and even for hard decisions that grow us deeper into faith. We bring before you all who are ill, who are struggling with hard decisions, who are looking for ways to make ends meet, and we ask for your strong, gracious presence. We bring before you our world, this wonderful garden that you planted and tended and cared for, and we ask for peace between our nations. We ask for peace among brothers and sisters who are fighting. We ask for peace within ourselves. And we ask for your love to infiltrate the hardest heart. Open our eyes to see you afresh, our resurrected Christ. And we celebrate your presence here today. And we give thanks that in life and in death and in life after death, we belong to you, our God of redeeming love. And it is together that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. One of the gifts that we have is the gift to give. And so as we give thanks for all that God has given to us and for the blessings of this faith community, I invite um, ushers to come forward and receive our gifts. Christ, we are so thankful that you keep showing your face to us again and again and again in the faces of those around us, in the faces of the poor and the marginalized, for all the ways you show up. We are so thankful. And I am particularly thankful, God, for this congregation, First Christian UCC of downtown Burlington, and the, the gifts that they give of themselves and their time and their resources. And you are the one who multiplies our gifts. So we ask that you take these offerings, bless them, and multiply them, we pray. In your name, amen.
much appreciation for leading us in singing and what a grace it is for all of you who step up and offer your gifts. So as you go out, may you remember that glorious message that God loves us. And while we may not a, be able to prove that part, it is the most important part of the whole gospel. You are loved by Christ eternally. So go out in the midst of your wonders, in the midst of all those things you do believe, and even in the midst of your doubts. Go out. Go out and live and share the good news of the gospel, the good news of God's love. Go out in peace. Amen.